Today, we're beginning a two-part Sunday series. That means you have to come back next week. You don't want half a message, right? You don't want to miss out. You want to hear the rest of the story next week. So we'll start this two-part message today in Mark chapter 16. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Brandon. Thank you for that. If anybody needs an exercise ball while I'm preaching, we have one handy right here. Mark chapter 16, it's one of the Great Commission passages, some of the final words of Jesus before his ascension. He's speaking to the importance of faith and the results of our faith or the function of our faith. Faith is more than just some kind of mental state, but there is a very real function, a practical application and function of our faith in our daily walk with God. So Jesus says to his followers in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. He speaks of the necessity of faith. You must believe and you must be baptized or you'll be condemned. This is part one of our message. And then verse 17, these signs will follow those who believe. That's going to be part two. So I'm telling you, you want to show up next week. In this verse 17, Jesus begins to detail the supernatural signs that follow and accompany those who have faith. That's the second function of faith. So faith is first for salvation and then for manifestation. Romans chapter 12, I believe Paul communicates the same message, just using different language. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. Don't allow yourself to be shaped by the pressure and standard of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is an internal work that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is an external work. God wants to do something on the inside of you so that there can be a manifestation and an evidence of that internal work. So our two-part series is titled The Two Functions of Faith. And I believe from these passages we can discern There are two primary functions of our faith. First, transformation, and second, demonstration. God is making a difference in us so that we can make a difference in the world. He wants to change us so that we can change our world. God has purpose beyond just our own salvation. There is purpose beyond just our own challenges and needs that we face. But he wants to do something through us. But first, there must be an internal transformation that takes place. So here's what I want us to do today and next week. I want us to exercise our faith. Faith is something you have to exercise. You have to use it. You have to express it. So beginning at the the outset of this message, would you take a moment with me right now and exercise your faith, however you want to do that, with our hands lifted, if you want to clap, if you want to shout or pray or praise, whatever you want to do, would you begin to exercise your faith right now? You believe that there is a God? Do you believe that there is a creator of the universe? Do you believe that there's a God who can do anything? Do you believe that there's a God who has filled this sanctuary with his presence? I want you to exercise your faith in him. Exercise your faith in his word right now. God, we believe that you have filled this place, that you have all power and all ability. God, that you desire to change and to transform your people and your church so we can fulfill your purpose. God, right now, we want you to inhabit the praises of your people. Meet us in this sanctuary right now. Meet us, God, at our point of need. I'm believing and praying for transformation in this service. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, if you really believe there's a God, will you give that God some praise and some thanks right now? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You can be seated. 
Faith is a journey. It's not just a moment in an altar. It's not just a simple prayer or even a single decision, but faith is an everyday kind of journey. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Faith has a beginning and faith has an end. There's the initiation of faith, this journey of faith, and ultimately the culmination of our faith. Faith has a certain beginning and a certain direction and a certain destination. Faith must be expressed through obedient action. When it is expressed, when we express our faith in this God that we say we believe in, then there will be an outcome. Faith is first for salvation and then for manifestation. It is first for transformation and then for demonstration. And I am confident today that it is the will of God to transform every individual in this service here today. Every single one of us, I believe that it is the will of God to change us. And if we are not changing and growing, then we are dying. If we're not getting closer to God, we're, we're moving further away from God. I believe as a church, we have to be in a constant growth mode and growth focus. If we're not growing, we're dying. If we're not taking more territory, we're losing territory. I believe it's the will of God to change and transform every single one of us today. If you don't like change, I got bad news for you. God loves change. God loves change. The one who never changes wants to change you. He, he doesn't want to leave you the same way that he found you. I don't know who wrote that song, but I love it. He didn't leave me the way that he found me. I'm thankful that the God who never changes has the power and the ability to change me. God loves change because he loves taking a sinner and changing them into a saint. He loves taking an alcoholic and changing them into a soul winner. He loves taking a drug dealer and changing them into a prayer warrior. Is there anybody that can testify with me? He changed you. He didn't leave you the same way that he found you. You're here today because God has made a difference in your life. God loves change. I love what happens around these altars because there's a change that happens here that can't happen anywhere else. I'm thankful for what doctors can do. I'm thankful for what psychologists and counselors can do. But there's a change that can only happen when God gets a hold of you. There's a change that only his blood can bring about in you. Now, for those who are nervous about my knee right now, it might be a good opportunity to give you an update. My knee's feeling better. Started running a little bit this last week, so I now have permission to run while I'm preaching. Short distances. God loves change. I'm thankful he loves change. Now, somebody said, you know, come to God just as you are. Well, that's, that's a great slogan. Absolutely. Come just as you are. Guess what? That's the only option you have. You, you can't come to him as something that you're not. You can only come to God as you are. Just know that God didn't leave you the way that he finds you. He wants to change you. God loves him change and for the purpose and of demonstrating his power through us and that he might receive glory. So Paul would tell the Romans, and I beseech you, I, I beg of you, I implore you, brothers and sisters, uh, by the mercies of God or in view of God's mercy, in light um, of God's mercy, that you present um, your bodies a living sacrifice to God. This um, is your initial expression of active, obedient faith. You have to do something. You can't just think about it. You got to do it. You have to present yourself and surrender yourself to God as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to him, which is your reasonable service. And I've said this before, but it's worth saying again, it is not unreasonable for God to ask a commitment out of us. It is not unreasonable for God to ask for a sacrifice every now and then. In fact, I think we throw around the word sacrifice way too casually. 
when you consider what Jesus Christ did on the cross, when you consider the stripes that he took upon his back and the crown of thorns upon his head, I don't think I've ever really sacrificed him. I don't think I've even come close. But it's not unreasonable for God to ask something out of me, some faithfulness, some obedience, some commitment, some sacrifice in view of God's mercy. It's not unreasonable. So in light of that, don't be conformed to this world. See, faith begins to function in our lives. When we express that faith, it starts to function. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't allow the pressure of this world to shape you according to its standard, but be transformed. It's not about conformation. It's about transformation. We're not trying to conform to some kind of biblical standard. We want to be transformed by the power of the word and the spirit. It's not about conformation. It's about transformation. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He wants to change the way you think because that's the only way you'll ever change your behavior. Right thoughts precede right actions. Wrong thoughts precede wrong actions. And we are transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove, that we may do, that we may fulfill the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're talking about an internal transformation that will have external evidence. If we have faith in an eternal creator of the universe, that faith in that God that's that powerful will produce transformation in us that has some external evidence. I need some help here. Grant, come on up here, buddy. Looking sharp today. Playing them drums hammering away. Thank God that all that racket that goes on in our house is being put to some good use every now and then. <laughs> Would you grab this, this inflated exercise ball for me here? Now, I am not a, an expert when it comes to physics. I'm not even sure what that word means. But it, it's my understanding that in order for this exercise ball to stay inflated, that the internal pressure has to remain greater than the external pressure. That if the external pressure becomes greater than the internal pressure, then this thing will collapse. It will deflate. But as long as the internal pressure is greater than the external pressure, then it is able to fulfill its purpose. Paul said, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. Don't allow the external pressure of the culture around you. Don't allow the external pressure of others. Don't allow external pressure from media or anywhere else become so great in your life. If that pressure is greater than the internal pressure, at some point, there's going to be some destruction that takes place, and you won't be able to fulfill the purpose that God has for you. As long as the internal pressure remains greater than the external pressure, then you can continue to fulfill purpose no matter what comes against you. You may feel that pressure, but it goes right back to its shape because the internal pressure is greater than the external pressure. That's why I'm at church today. Because there's a lot of external pressure. There's a lot of junk and stuff and voices and news and, and fears and everything else going on. That's why I'm at church. Because I want to make sure I'm full of the Holy Ghost. That's why I pray every day. Because I want to make sure I'm full of the Holy Ghost. That's why I read the Word of God. That's why I need preaching. Because I want to make sure the internal pressure remains greater than the external pressure. That's why we need God more than ever. That's why we need church more than ever. That's why we've got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about internal transformation that produces an external demonstration. We've got to maintain that daily relationship and the connection with the body that enables an internal transformation to take place. It can't happen any other way. You can't read enough self-help books to make you strong enough and have enough willpower and positive mental attitude to figure it all out. It takes transformation on the inside of us in order to withstand the external pressure around us. Now let's talk about the role of the purpose of faith. See, faith is our personal responsibility in this process of transformation and demonstration. 
We've all been given a measure of faith, this personal ability that we all have to believe, to express trust or confidence in something or somebody. You are expressing faith every day that you live. You're either going to express faith in God, in yourself, something else, somebody else, somebody else's opinion, your own opinion. You're always expressing faith. The question is not whether you will express faith or not. It's who are you going to put your faith in? What are you going to put your faith in? Just because somebody believes something does not make it right. Just because somebody says, I I believe this because there are some people who believe some crazy things. I mean, if anything that social media and the internet has done, it has exposed us to a lot of ignorance. Just because somebody believes something doesn't make it right. There's a whole group out there that still believes the world is flat. You can go to the flat earth society.org. They got a whole group out there. They're on a crusade trying to convince people that the world is flat. Just because they believe something doesn't make it right. I think Kyrie Irving a couple of years ago, and he was still with the, the calves, came out and said he thought the, the earth was flat. I don't know if that was a publicity stunt, if he was just trying to get more social media followers or just, just make a joke or if he's just crazy. I'm thinking, you know, Kyrie, this is a little bigger than a basketball, but that thing that you shoot so well, that is so nice and round, that is the shape of the earth that you're living on. Maybe, maybe he's watching today. Just because somebody believes it doesn't make it right. Just because a majority votes for something doesn't make it right. Doesn't matter what a majority of Americans believe. If it is not in alignment with the word of God, it's not right. Because belief itself is not a virtue. Faith itself is not a virtue. It's possible to believe something that is not true. I could say all day long today that the sky is green and that grass is blue, but that didn't make it right. Unless you're in Kentucky, maybe. There's something called bluegrass, I think, down there. I don't think they have green sky, though. So it's a half truth. Come on, work with me, people, today. Work with me. It's as good as the comedy gets today. Just because I believe it doesn't make it right, it makes me delusional. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it's possible to believe a lie, to have faith in a lie. I, I want to deal with something right now. I heard this the other day on Christian radio, and it just disturbed me. It bothered me. And I, 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 I want to deal with a, a kind of a terminology and, and a phrase and a mindset that I think is very dangerous. This Christian artist was talking about them embracing their truth. They said, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful that I was able to embrace my truth and express my truth. Now I understand. I think I understand what they were trying to say. I think I understand what they were trying to express, that they had felt the strength or the courage or the freedom to be able to express some kind of challenge or maybe even a failure or a struggle in their life, their past, and and they finally felt the ability to talk about that and express. Now, they were not expressing their truth. They were just being honest. They were just being transparent. I have a problem with this phrase, my truth. Number one, because of the source, this kind of language is being used in our culture today. People living their truth and expressing their truth and embracing their truth. That kind of language is being used today typically to justify sinful behavior. It says, I'm okay to live this way because I'm embracing my truth and I'm living my truth. I have a problem with that kind of mindset because there is only one truth. We don't all get to determine and define our own truth. There is only one truth and his name is Jesus and the one who said, I am the way, the truth and the life. There's only one truth. He said, my word is truth. We don't get to define our own truth. It's already been defined in the word of God. You got to be careful because your truth can be deceitful. Our heart is deceitful and wicked. 
the word says nobody can even know their own heart. And our heart is so powerful that it has the ability to convince our mind that what it wants is right. We are masters at self-justification. It's amazing the lengths to which we will go in order to justify behavior that we want to be involved in in spite of what the Word of God says, in spite of what spiritual authority says. And that's why we need a pastor in our lives. Because every man is right in his own eyes. And it's possible for us to believe a lie. I've got a pastor. I have a pastor. My dad is my pastor. He's been my pastor since I was 13 years old. And I thank God for a man of God who I can talk to, who will, will look me in the eye and say, thus saith the word of the Lord. I thank God for a pastor. I thank God for our bishop who I submit myself to. And a bishop says, pastor, you're making a bad decision, going a wrong direction. I'm going to fall down on my knees and repent and say, God, help me. We'll go a different direction because we have no authority unless we're under authority. We have no power unless we're under spiritual authority. That's why we have to have that voice and our life um, that will speak truth to us the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints of marrow. it is a discerner of the thought um, and the intents uh, of our heart um, we need the word of God we need daily devotion with the word and we need the preached word of God that will be able to discern the internal struggle that's going on the battle that's trying to fight against the the transformation that God wants to do in your life um, we need the word to give us direction I'm not your pastor today just because you attend Christian Life Center and pay your tithes here. That doesn't make me your pastor. I'm your pastor when there is submission to spiritual authority. I'm not after a power grab today. No, I feel the weight of an eternal responsibility that I have to try to help you make it to heaven. I feel the weight of that responsibility. And submission begins where agreement ends. That's when you know whether or not you have a pastor in your life when there is disagreement. I want to ask you this question today. Who has veto power in your life? Young person, who has veto power in your life? Adult, who has veto power in your life? Is there anybody that you have submitted yourself to that if they said, no, you don't need to do that. No, you don't need to go there. No, you don't need to date them. No, you don't need that relationship. No, I know that job pays more, but it's going to be detrimental to your spiritual walk. And no, you don't need to do that. You don't need to be involved in that. It's going to destroy your future and your purpose and your involvement in God. Is there anybody that has veto power in your life? It's a dangerous place to be when we say, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. That's a scary place to be spiritually, especially when somebody says, ain't no preacher going to tell me what to do. I, I promise I'm not trying to make anybody do anything. I've discovered that's not even possible. Not even possible, but I do have a few suggestions that I think could be helpful to help you overcome some things and make it to heaven and take your family with you. Just because somebody believes something doesn't make it right. Just because somebody is passionate, just because somebody is sincere doesn't make them right. They can be passionate, but, but deceived. They can be sincerely wrong. We need the word of God to give us clarity and direction. If ever there was a day that we need the word of God to help us to discern what is right and what is wrong in a day when terminology is being turned upside down and terms are being changed and good is being called evil and evil is being called good and black is called white and white is called black and it's all changed. And in this day, in this hour, we need the word of God to give us direction. We need a spirit of discernment. We need to be full of the Holy Ghost every day to make sure that we can counter that external pressure that's coming against us. Faith is not powerful because of the person or the personality who possesses it or the abilities of the one who expresses it. I, I have this 
feeling that at times we think that there are only certain people that can express faith or certain people that can have great faith. But the, the power of faith is not found in the person expressing it. And the most important element of faith is where that faith is placed, not where it comes from, not who it comes from. Faith is only powerful when it is placed in something powerful. Faith that is placed in a lie is not powerful. It is bondage and deception. But faith that is placed in the one who has all power is powerful faith. When you put your faith in the name that's above every name, the only healing name, the only saving name, when you put your faith in that name, your faith is powerful. It's not because of you. It's not who you are. It's because of him and who he is. When you put your faith in the word of God, your faith is powerful. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Your faith is powerful when you put it in the only thing that's right, the only thing that is true. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Your faith is powerful when you're standing on a firm foundation when everything that can be shaken is being shaken today. Your faith is strong when it's placed in something that is strong. His word is right. His word is right. Every time his word is right. He's never missed it. He's never missed it. Prophets who wrote... 4,000, 5,000 years ago. Apostles who wrote 2,000 years ago. The word is still as relevant today as it's ever been. God has never missed it. His word is still right and it still works today. There's two forms of this word, believe. There, there is an expression that we use at times. We say we believe something when we don't really mean it. I believe. You've said it. I've said it. I believe this is the answer. It's like when the student is asked the question by the teacher and they answer the question with a question. I believe this is the answer, maybe, possibly. It's like their voice is trailing off into the atmosphere with a lot of question marks behind it. I, I, I think that's it. I, I think that's right. That, that's my opinion. I suspect, I suppose, I assume, I presume, I... I guess that that is the right answer. We use this word, I believe that is it, sometimes as a weak expression of possibility. But that is not the kind of faith that Jesus is looking for today. That's not the kind of faith that's going to be transform, transformational. He's looking for a kind of faith that is a declaration of fact and a statement of certainty and conviction to regard something as absolute truth and to be absolutely convinced and, and assured to have confidence in, to have trust in. It is to know that you know that you know that you know know that no matter what else is going on, you just know God's in control. No matter what you see, you just know that it's going to be all right. No matter what you feel, you just know that you know that you know everything is going to turn out all right. All things, they still work together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. I believe that's the kind of faith that the writer of Hebrews would define in chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance. It's something tangible. Substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of something that I haven't seen yet. And yet my faith has given me some evidence that it's going to happen. It's the kind of faith that is tangible. The kind of faith that reaches from this dimension into another dimension. That reaches into another world. That reaches beyond the natural into the supernatural. It's the kind of faith that somebody can get a hold of on a Sunday morning to, to believe that God can change me. And he can transform me. I can walk out those doors a different person than the one who walked in. It is the kind of faith that allows us to see what the physical eye cannot see. It allows us to feel what our physical touch can't perceive. To know with confidence what our finite 
limited comprehension cannot understand. It's the kind of faith that gives us peace that passes our understanding. It's how we can comprehend the love of God that surpasses knowledge. It's a faith that expects to see something that you have never seen before. It's the kind of faith that has a, a bold, maybe some would call it a little bit crazy kind of faith. People who don't have this kind of faith can't understand it. They, they don't understand why you're even here on this Sunday morning. People who haven't encountered God like we have to, to understand the supernatural things that our God can do. They don't understand the kind of faith that you can have in the face of, of devastating diagnosis. And they don't have the, the, the understanding. How, how can they comprehend the kind of God that can give peace in the midst of grief and loss? And the kind of God that can give you assurance in the middle of a storm. They don't understand it. But that's the kind of faith that I feel rising up in this place today that believes that the God who can do anything, he's got me in the middle of his hands. He's got me in the middle of his plan. I trust him even when I don't understand him. I have confidence in him even when I cannot comprehend what he's doing. See, true biblical faith is always connected to action. Hebrews 11 verse 6, a few verses later. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. We can't even start the journey, the initiation of our relationship with him. It's impossible to please him without faith. For he who comes to God must believe, first of all, that he is, the acknowledgement that there is a creator. But not just that he is and that he exists, but he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This verse gives us this understanding that God is not a rewarder of those who have great faith. He is a rewarder of those who activate their faith. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's a rewarder of those who take that thought, that feeling, and allow it to turn into a conviction that moves us into purposeful action. It's not enough just to think it in your heart. Faith is more than a thought. Faith is more than a mental concept. you got to verbalize your faith. You got to declare your faith. You have to express your faith through your words and through your actions. James said, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. He also said in chapter two, verse 19, you believe that there is one God. Good job. Congratulations. That's a great start. You believe there's one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Uh oh. Another translation, the, the Passion Translation. This is a very dynamic translation, so be careful when you're reading and studying this translation because there's some passages that get kind of crazy. But I like the way it says it in this verse, the Passion Translation. You can believe all you want that there's one true God. That's wonderful. That's great. But even the demons know this and tremble with fear before him. Yet they're unchanged. They remain demons. They know that there is a God. They even believe that there is a God. But there is no transformation. What good is faith if there's no transformation? What good is faith if there's no change? What good is faith if there's no conversion? What good is faith if we walk out those doors the same way that we came in? That mental concept of who you believe God is has to be turned into that conviction that moves you to purpose and to action. There is absolutely unbelievable potential in this room today. When you start to think about them, a couple of hundred people gathered together with faith in a God who can do anything, there's unbelievable potential, not only in this room, but when we leave today and you think about the dozens and maybe the hundreds of people that you'll come in contact with this week, there are literally, literally thousands of people that our church family will come in contact with over the course of the next week or two, but potential never accomplished anything. Potential's not enough. The possibility isn't enough. We've got to activate our faith. We've got to move that potential into reality. We've got to move that possibility into reality. That transformation has to move us into demonstration. Faith is first for salvation and transformation. Belief, conviction, action. Belief, repentance, 
Baptism in water in Jesus' name. Baptism in the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. You must be born again of water into the Spirit. Belief, conviction, action. And you will receive power after you receive the Holy Ghost. Not just power to feel good. Not just power to make it to heaven, but power to become something. Power to be witnesses unto him. God has given you the power to become. Some of you right now are thinking that you could never be anything in the kingdom of God. Just a nothing, a nobody. I've wasted too many opportunities, too many missed chances behind me, too much history, too much past, too many mistakes, too much I've done wrong. And you're sitting there thinking, I'm just a nobody. But I've come to declare to you today, God wants to give you the power to become. There's a transformation that he's working in you because he wants you to become something. John chapter 1, verse 11, he came into his own and his own rejected him, received him not, but as many as received him to those who believed in him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He's given us the power to become. This is the first function of faith, to become something in God, a change that starts to happen within us, a transformation that is at work in our lives. I'm bringing this message to a close. There's an enemy that you, you got to be aware of today. You got to be aware of this enemy. There's an enemy who does not want you to become what God is trying to make of you. What God is trying to transform you into. There is an enemy of your faith. Fear is the enemy of your faith. The moment you start to activate your faith, fear comes along and starts to battle in your mind. Fear comes along and stands as a barrier between you and that manifestation, that expression of faith, that act of obedient faith. And one of the most powerful manifestations of fear we find in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God that whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You see, there is an inversely proportional relationship between condemnation and confidence. There's an inversely proportional relationship between condemnation and confidence. The more condemnation you're dealing with, the less confidence that you have in God. But the less con condemnation that you deal with, the more confidence you have that God will do what you ask him to do. I've come today in the closing of this message to deal with this weapon of the enemy called condemnation that, that brings fear in the face of your faith today. The moment you would try to express your faith and confidence in God, that fear rises up. And so often it is manifest as condemnation. But there are two things that I want you to know today. First of all, I want you to understand that the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar and he is the father of lies and everything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. In fact, when the devil tells you it can't happen and you're a loser and you'll never make it, you ought to dance all over the place because you have this revelation that the exact opposite is true, that no matter what the devil says, the opposite is going to come to pass. He is a liar and he is the father of lies and I rebuke every lie of the enemy. I rebuke the liar today. Devil, you got to get out of here. You have no place here. You have no place in our homes. You have no place in our minds. You got to get out of here. You are a liar. The second thing I want you to understand today is that condemnation is not of God. It is not of God. There are two sources of condemnation. Number one, the first source of condemnation is sin. If, if we are living in sin, we will deal with condemnation. Condemnation is a natural, con, uh, natural expression of sin. It's a natural consequence of sin. If we are living in sin, there will be condemnation that we deal with. 
So I've got a word for anybody today. If you're living in sin, if there's hidden sin, if there's some part of your life you hadn't surrendered to God, if there's something that you're doing, your spouse doesn't know about, your parents don't know about, something you need to confess, something you need to make right. I've got this word for you today. It's a very simple one word answer. If you're living in sin, stop. Just stop. Stop going that direction. Stop doing those things. Stop going there. Whatever it takes, whoever you have to talk to to be accountable to somebody, if you're dealing with addictive sin, you're going to have to tell somebody. You're going to have to be accountable to somebody. You can't overcome addictive sin, whether it's drugs or alcohol or gambling or pornography or whatever it might be. The only way you can overcome addictive sin is you got to talk to somebody, become accountable to somebody, and repent of your sins. You just stop. That's what the word repent means. You're going one direction and you stop and you turn around and you go a different direction. That's what the word repent means. So one source of condemnation is sin. And there's an easy way to deal with sin. We repent of it. We give it to God. But the second source of condemnation is it is a weapon of the enemy. It is a tool of the enemy that he uses to battle your mind. You've repented of your sins and God has forgiven you of your sins and yet you can't forgive yourself. You, you can't let it go. You can't let go of the past. And, and, and the moment uh, that you try to step out in faith, and that condemnation comes back and the enemy uses it as a weapon against you. Condemnation is, is, a, fear of form, uh, uh, is, is a form of fear that destroys the foundation of your faith. And it is a weapon of the enemy. And when condemnation is at work, we have no power. When condemnation is at work, we have no confidence in God. You try to pray, but condemnation comes. You can't even lift your hands. The weight is so heavy. You try to worship, but condemnation comes. You, you, you can't express that worship that you want to. You have no liberty, no freedom. You, you want to testify to that person, but condemnation comes and says, who do you think you are? To try to witness you, you want to teach that Bible study, but condemnation comes and says, you, you, you don't know enough and you're not good enough and you don't have what it takes and look at your past and you want to sing that song, but condemnation comes. You, you want to preach that message, but condemnation comes. You, you want to work in that ministry and fulfill God's purpose, but condemnation comes and battles against him, your mind and your spirit. It's a tool of the enemy that he uses to keep potential locked up within the people of God. The possibility is there. The potential is there, but condemnation has it all bound up. We're going to do something a little bit different today. We're going we're gonna to start our altar service right where you are in the pew today. There's, there's only one way to deal with condemnation that is the result of sin, and we, we have to repent of sin. That's that's the only way to deal with that source of condemnation. We, we just have to repent. But then the next step is trusting the blood of Jesus Christ that we were just singing about. That wonder working power of the blood. It's trusting that the work that Jesus did on Calvary has the power to set us free from the law of sin has the power to set us free from the judgment of sin, from the condemnation and the shame and the guilt of sin. We just have to trust God that when we repent of our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins. So here's what we're going to do. I, I'm going to invite you right where you're sitting, right there in your pew. I'm, I'm going to invite you to enter into a season of repentance here right where you are would you just close your eyes across the sanctuary right now i i want you to enter into a very personal intimate time with god where you shut out all the distractions around you and forget who's sitting beside you for a moment and just focus upon your relationship with jesus christ right now are you where you need to be in that relationship is there any hidden sin is there anything you have not repented of if you are sick 
and tired of dealing with condemnation and guilt and shame that is the result of sins with you have not repented of sins that are hidden sins that you have not been honest with God about and transparent with God. If you are sick and tired um, of that condemnation, this is your moment um, and your opportunity today to open your heart to God and to say, God, I am sorry. I repent, God. Lord, I, I repent of my sins, every failure, every mistake, um, every word, every thought, every motive, every attitude, every bad spirit, everything I've done and said, anything, um, God, that I've done that was not pleasing to you. God, if I missed the mark, um, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I repent for my sin, oh God. I invite you right now, would you just lift your voice and talk to the Lord and make your heart available to Him? Would you allow Him to just search you right now? Would you take this opportunity? Come on, Jesus told us every day that repentance ought to be a part of our daily prayer time with God. Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive others. Lord, their debts that they owe us, maybe part of your repentance right now will be forgiving somebody else. and Maybe part of your repentance and asking God to forgive you you would be you forgiving somebody else and whatever you need to do right now God and search my heart and know me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting God search my mind every thought and search my heart my emotions God I want you to walk up and down the hallways of my heart God and search every room search every part of me God if there's anything and not pleasing to you if there's anything not right God, I'm sorry. God, I repent. I'm going to stop going that direction. I'm going to turn around and go a different direction. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. O God, purge me. Wash me and cleanse me. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. Come on, somebody needs to get honest with God right now. You got to make sure that you're right with God. You got to make sure that there's nothing you're holding back, that there's nothing that you have failed to surrender to God. Oh, God, search us right now. Search us right now, God. Search us, God. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the times I've disappointed you. I'm sorry for the times I've been unfaithful. I'm sorry, God, for those thoughts that I had that were not right. I'm sorry for those words that I spoke in anger and even words that I spoke in doubt, God, when I questioned your will and I questioned your purpose, God. Words that I spoke in unbelief, God. Words that I spoke from a position of fear. God, forgive me right now, God. Forgive me for my sins of commission and forgive me for my sins of omission. God, the good things that I knew I needed to do, but I failed to do. The opportunities that I had to act, but I failed to act. And the opportunities that I had to give or serve or do something good for somebody, but I allowed that condemnation to stand as an obstacle before me. God, would you forgive me for missed opportunities? And God, I surrender that regret to you right now. I pray in the name of Jesus, and God, that your blood would flow in this sanctuary right now. God, that you would set free from that condemnation, that shame and guilt and insecurity and intimidation right now that the enemy would try to use against your people. God, we surrender it to you right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins. He's faithful and he just. And he died to forgive you of your sins. He wants to forgive you of your sins. He wants to set you free from that bondage. He wants to deliver you. He wants to transform you today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. 
in the name of Jesus, I want you just now to begin thanking the Lord for his forgiveness. You may not feel it yet. You may not feel that freedom yet, but I want you to thank the Lord for forgiving you. Thank the Lord for setting you free. Thank the Lord for his blood. Thank him right now for Calvary. Thank you, Jesus, for the price that you paid for my freedom. Thank you, Jesus, for washing me and cleansing me and purging me. God, I'm, I'm surrendering this condemnation to you. God, I'm going to trust the power of your blood right now. I'm going to trust the authority in your name, God, to remove the, the penalty of sin, to remove that curse of sin, to remove the bondage of sin, to remove the condemnation shame and guilt of sin I'm trusting the power of your blood right now in the name of Jesus and in the name of Jesus I, I know this prayer time has been very personal but but now I want us to begin to transition a little bit here because I I believe that God is going to give somebody victory in the next few moments I, I want you to get a hold of the hand of somebody who is close to you right now I mean you may have to move to find somebody but I I want you to connect with somebody you you may be very close to them. It might be a spouse or it may be a family member or a friend or maybe somebody that you don't even know. You may be completely unaware of the battles that they fight, battles of condemnation, feelings of worthlessness and insecurity and intimidation that they're battling right now. They want to be transformed. They want to see the demonstration of the Holy Ghost in their lives, but they are bound by that condemnation that battles against them that says they will never be able to reverse the curse of the past and that they'll never find complete freedom from that addiction complete freedom from the baggage and the pain maybe they know God's forgiven me but there's consequences I'll never be able to overcome there's a stigma I'll never be able to overcome I rebuke that lie of the enemy right now Come on, I want you to pray with boldness. Stop praying for yourself and start praying for the person next to you. And pray with boldness and authority. God, I'm declaring liberty right now over and from that condemnation. He that the Son has set free is free indeed. He says that you're worth it. He says that you have value and purpose and a future and a destiny. I rebuke I rebuke every lie of the enemy. I rebuke that spirit of condemnation. I rebuke that spirit of guilt and shame. You don't have to feel ashamed in his presence. You can lift your face toward heaven right now and say, I am forgiven. I am victorious. I am an overcomer. I'm more than a conqueror. Come on, you have more power than you realize. There's more potential within you than you understand or realize. I feel faith rising up in this house right now. This is the function of faith. It's a transformation that takes place. When we overcome condemnation and we start to feel some confidence in God. I feel confidence rising in this house right now. I wonder, is, is there anybody that, that would take the hand of that person you're holding on to right now and you would lead them down to this altar right now? Is there anybody that would just step out from where you are and say, come on, come on, condemnation, we're leaving it behind. Shame and guilt, we're leaving it behind. We're stepping into transformation. I feel that anointing of transformation starting to sweep through this sanctuary right now.